I was just annoying Mark by telling him that I decided to ask ChatGPT to write his intro. <laughs> so um, today we're honored to welcome Mark Yazgar, a leading researcher at the intersection of natural language processing and computer vision, whose work is pivotal in en enabling AI systems to understand the complex relationship between images and text. Mark has made significant contributions to the field through his research on bias and fairness within AI, striving to develop equitable and unbiased systems. Additionally, he has been instrumental in creating large-scale annotated data sets and benchmarks, providing invaluable resources that drive forward the capabilities of AI technologies. Um, Mark is a professor of Penn. Um, I've known him for um, uh, a long time, um, 14 years, I think, or something to that effect. Um, this is why you should go to uh, uh, visit days um, and be nice to all the people that are visiting prospective PhD programs and stuff like that. Is because even if you go to different PhD programs, um, your paths will eventually still cross and then you'll still be forced to hang out with each other a decade later. Um, so uh, it's, been, it's been really nice to basically see that entire trajectory. Um, and he's been one of those people where when I was thinking about moving into increasingly multimodal spaces, he was already there and doing good work. And so it's useful to have those types of people around who give you a sense of what the field is actually about, what are the core questions that you should be thinking about, and have their own sort of version and brand on the whole thing. Um, so since then, he's obviously started his own lab, and so I no longer know everything that he's up to, but I get to learn at least some of it here. So thank you, and welcome, Mark. All right. Um, thank you, Yonatan. Um, honestly, I think both uh, you and ChatGPT and ChatGPT are factual, although the like superlatives are maybe somewhat unreasonable. Um, so I think that's the way in which ChatGPT fails. Um, just like as a, as a note, we, I was just had a talk. Um, just the other day, there was an interview at Penn, and like the interview candidate, I was hosting them, and they tried to like give my bio as an example for hallucination for ChatGPT and it totally failed. Like it misrepresented like where, you know, who my advisors were when I graduated and all these things. Anyways, okay. Um, thank you, Yonatan. And um, today I'm going to be talking about um, inherent interpretability. Um, this is kind of a new kind of thread that me and my lab have been working on for maybe uh, one to two years. I want to just set the stage first um, in, a, in, in a kind of uh, figure that I hope we all find familiar um, and don't scoff too much at. Um, so this is, this is a figure that my brother actually sent me, um, who's not a computer scientist, um, asking me like, hey, is this true? Is this like really what's happening in AI? And actually, I have to admit, it is somewhat true um, in as much as um, maybe we don't like quite agree with um, the labels here, like language understanding, um, but actually, we can, I think we can all agree in the last maybe five years, everything looks much, much, much better. Um, almost, you know, incomparably so. Um, this is a figure taken from um, Dynabench, and actually each of these plots has a particular name. So image recognition is ImageNet, and legitimately ImageNet, um, you know, classifier performance on ImageNet exceeded human performance, certainly mine, almost immediately because there's 200 dog breeds in there. Okay. Uh, natural language understanding, uh, which you guys might care about more here, um, is uh, glue and super glue, uh, which I think is actually, you know, a bad naming scheme from those folks. Uh, but I think we can all say definitely kind of NLU has massively taken a step up. Um, and there's a simple explanation here. Again, I think this is something that many of us could uh, kind of agree with, which is that maybe what's driving this kind of massive improvement is actually the amount of training data and model size that we're actually employing. Okay, so this is kind of a graph of you know, the combination of these two factors, so petaflops and training, um, over time. And really, when models got a lot better, you know, petaflops massively exploded, okay? And so my claim is if we change this axis to understanding, okay, and defined understanding somewhat flexibly, like what are the knowledge dependencies in the model, what are the biases, what are the expected failures, actually probably the graph would be the exact inverse, okay, which is over this time, actually we know much, much less, 
Um, and in part because um, we've massively increased the number of parameters in the models, right, and reduced the kind of inductive biases of the models. Now we're running transformers. We think they're really flexible. They model arbitrary data. But we also don't necessarily know when they'll fail because of that. And worse still, we've put in so much data that there's no method to actually really quantify what's in there because we can't look through it in any practical sense. OK? So um, kind of when things go wrong, this puts us in a tricky position. Um, so let's say we've kind of like built an image classifier for like given an entity in an image, what, is it, what are they doing? Um, we kind of have this particular set of input images, all women who are washing their hands, and the classifier keeps saying cooking, and we, we might feel suspicious at this point. Like, is there something wrong with the classifier? Why is it making this prediction? And kind of the only thing that we can really do at this point is actually kind of investigate this post hoc. Okay, so the classifier itself is a black box. What, most of what we can do is kind of propagate information about the prediction back to the pixels, okay, and kind of know which regions supported this prediction, okay. And honestly, for these set of pixels, I'm actually really unsure whether this is a biased classifier or not, in part because certainly to detect some sort of action, you should be looking at people, okay, and this classifier is looking at people, okay, and it should probably be looking at, you know, objects that those people are interacting with. It's doing that, OK? So is this biased or is it just bad, OK? And so this isn't really a hypothetical. Um, certainly like the gender bias case we've seen before in my previous work and other people's. Um, but kind of my favorite example these days um, kind of revolves around COVID. Basically, right when COVID came out, there were lots of chest x-ray data sets trying to predict whether people had COVID or not just from chest x-ray. This is like before PCR test. OK, so the best we could do is try to make the prediction based on the state of their lungs. And people train these classifiers to really high accuracies. Um, and basically what these researchers found, this is, um, this is uh, some folks at UW, is that if you train these classifiers on data from one hospital and then test them on data from another hospital, these classifiers completely fall apart. Okay, pandemic. If we kind of like think back, this is a huge problem, right? Because we're getting data from Wuhan, right? So that we can predict COVID in New York. Okay, um, so this is like a massive fail case. And what they did is actually say, okay, hey, let's figure out what's going wrong. These are interpretability researchers. And what they did is they did some of these saliency map methods to figure it out. And they basically found, hey. You know, it seems like the relevant regions for this prediction are completely outside of the lungs. So that like, can't be a good classifier. That's what's going wrong. Okay? And what they did, because they're good computer scientists, they just cropped out the lung. And actually, this didn't help at all. Okay. So this is, this is a huge problem. Actually, this kind of notion of, of doing a post hoc justification of prediction is kind of largely been argued against because we have no guarantees that these post hoc explanations of what the classifiers or predictors are doing are actually connected to the underlying behavior of the model. Um, so this is a diagram from Cynthia Rodin basically pointing out that uh, at least for images, most models always look in the same spot. <laughs> um, so web images have this funny feature where a person took them and so the most important thing is, center, is centered and focused as a kind of norm. Um, and so you know, here's a classifier making prediction about Siberian Husky. Let's say I gave you this heat map kind of you know, as justification that the Husky classifier is doing the right thing. Um, you'd see it, you're like, yeah, snouts. That's like what Huskies are all about. It's about the shape and the ears, maybe a little bit about the texture of the face. You'd be really happy. Um, you trade classifier that happens to make prediction that this is a transverse flute, okay, that this is just a flute, okay, same pixels, okay, same justification. Um, so this should really cause pause that this is a real explanation of what's going on. Um, and so what Cynthia has been arguing for a long time is actually we shouldn't be doing this kind of post hoc explanation at all. Um, and I kind of buy into this. Um, 
and in particular saying that actually we should be building inherent interpretability into our system. Okay? So that we don't need some sort of secondary analysis on the system to say why it's making some sort of prediction. Um, okay. I'm going to like specialize this for this talk and talk about a particular version of this, okay, which, which is this kind of desire to be able to look inside of a model and fix it or certify it in term, and inspect it in terms of what information it depends on. So nothing, nothing beyond that. Okay? Um, the kind of goal here being if we go to this like, hypothetical um, gender biased class, you know, cooking classifiers, you know, we could form a committee, right? And if we knew that this classifier was specifically looking at sinks and women, we could say, hey, this is really inappropriate. This has a lot of potential for gender bias. We don't certify this. We'll never deploy it, even if it happens to be accurate sometimes. Okay? And then alternatively, right, we might like get a different classifier and then the committee might approve, right? Sinks are still relevant, but we're not specifically looking at women. We're looking at just the people and maybe some sort of other supporting cue like food as the cooking classifier. We approve this and then we deploy it. Okay. So that's the kind of like general setup. Um, I'm going to talk about a particular type of um, inherently interpretable model. So I want to tell you about this and then basically the rest of the talk will be about this kind of model and how we extend it and some of its limitations. Okay. So the model that we're going to be working with is concept bottlenecks. Um, it's a kind of like model in three steps, okay, where essentially what you do, sorry, um, essentially what you do is first you define a set of like human readable attributes. These are your concepts. And this is like a commitment about what your system is going to depend on. Okay, and this comes usually from a human. So this is hand designed. So this is like an example from fine grained bird recognition. So given an image, decide what species of bird it is. Usually these attributes look like specific like, you know, shapes that a specialist would know. Like, you know, the feathers should be this way and should have a particular pattern, and that's what's filled here. Um, then given that, you build a neural network, okay, which can go from an image to these particular attributes. Okay, so this requires training data. Okay. And then given you know, predictions of whether or not these attributes are in the image, you train a model, linear model, that predicts, you know, that final label just from the predictions of the attributes. Okay. We, this is a concept bottleneck, right? Because we're specifically bottlenecking on the information we are committing to having. Um, I'm going to claim it has inherent interpretability. Okay. Um, and in these particular three ways. Um, so if I wanted to know from this model, what aspects of the input are globally important. Okay? What I could do, not post hoc, I could just extract you know, from this construction procedure the concept names and the weights in the linear layer. And that would tell me you know, which concepts are important for the prediction. Okay? And I know this is faithful to the actual underlying classifier, because that's the computation it's going to perform. Um, I could also ask you know, which concepts contributed to particular prediction. Right, and this is a combination of the image, you know, the scores on the attributes, and the weights. Okay, and then I could ask also, how dependable is a concept? Right, well, what I would do is I'd just take a sample of images, check the activations, and kind of compute accuracy. Okay, and so I get these things for free, and I know that they're faithful. Okay. Um, so people have built these kinds of models, and they have lots of problems. Um, the biggest is actually like a performance issue. That this construction procedure had a lot of human specified components, and often they don't work that well. Right? This is, in some sense, the whole purpose of deep learning, right? to not have to do this. Um, and so, kind of central challenge is that these things underperform. Another is just the sheer amount of human supervision required to construct them. <coughs> Right? Like, how do you generate this kind of thing for arbitrary tasks when like, you need insight, you need an expert, you have to sit them down. This doesn't scale at all. Um, OK. And uh, I'm going like, to be a downer a little bit um, and say there's lots of ideas that these uh, challenges are insurmountable. Um, 
And so, I don't know, maybe folks have read Rich Sutton's Bitter Lesson. I think this like reflects a lot of the ethos these days. So seeking improvement that makes a difference in the shorter term, researchers seek to leverage their human knowledge of a domain, but the only thing that matters in the long run is leveraging computation. Okay, and then DARPA in 2019, when they wanted to run a project, just made up a graph trading off performance and like how good an explanation is. They just think if you have good explanations, you'll have bad performance. It's just positive. Um, okay, um, and so what I want to do today, um, quickly, um, is just offer some counter evidence, okay, to these particular ideas in two domains and offer some possible applications. Um, and basically, the short story of the talk is um, we're going to try to get around some of these limitations by leveraging language models uh, to actually construct these bottlenecks for us automatically. Um, so here's the scenario. Um, this is how we're going to do image classification um, for arbitrary tasks using a language model to actually just generate bottlenecks for us. Um, you know, a human was responsible for generating concepts. All we're going to do is ask GPT, a GPT model, to describe, you know, attributes of this target classification. Um, so what could this look like? You know, hey, it takes place in a kitchen, involves pots, and so forth. Okay. There was a data labeling component that we needed to get around, which was you need data to kind of build predictors. Um, the kind of setup here is actually we're going to use another you know, multimodal language model clip to actually produce this grounding zero shot, so data free. Okay, and then the last piece here we'll actually do from training data from the final task and just learn this linear layer. Okay, and the kind of hope here, right, is that actually um, before you had this problem where the human was hand specifying this layer and it sometimes worked, sometimes didn't, often didn't. It was like not a good specification. Um, what we could do now is actually like optimize over the LLM generations to make this good for prediction. Okay, um, so I'm going to show you how this works in images. Um, we've also gotten a version of this to work for language, um, which essentially like the setup here is let's say you have some classification task like movie reviews. Um, the same idea doesn't work in uh, in part because actually GPT models aren't self-reflective of what they know about language. It's hard to prompt that information out. Um, and so what we do is leverage a different fact, which is that um, GPT models are great at summarizing data. Um, they're very just, this is one of their core competencies, so you prompted something like propose an important aspect of some sampled training examples, okay, from your data set. Um, it'll propose things like food quality, overall ambience, price value, and meetings. Um, then you'll use another GPT model to actually rate these attributes on like a scale and then kind of proceed in the same way. Like learn a linear layer and now you've kind of accomplished the whole task without involving humans at all. And in principle could do this for any task, right? Because all you have to do is leverage, you know, GPT's ability to summarize data. Okay. And then this kind of part, right, is, you know, handled again by a zero shot model and you can optimize the structure of this piece to be high performance. Okay, that's the plan. Um, and I've said this twice. Uh, okay, so uh, here's the outline. Is it, what? Okay, um, so it's been 15 minutes, so we will speed up. We'll see what we have time for. Uh, basically, I'm gonna talk about more or less two projects, one in language, one in vision. Um, a little bit more on the vision side. Um, we'll see how much I get to in just the language side. And there's kind of like a new result that I'm super excited for that I'm just sticking in here. And if we don't have time for something else, that's just the way it is. Uh, because I think this is the most exciting thing on my mind right now. OK. Um, OK. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is how to build these models for image classification. This was a project at CVPR this last year run by Yue Yang, Artemis, and Chen Hao. Yue Yang and Artemis are joint students between me and CCB. Um, the basic kind of uh, premise is actually we know and have known for a very, very long time that language models know a huge amount about the physical world. 
Um, and this has been true even for pre-transformer-based like transformer -based language models, like count-based language models you know a ton about the physical world. You can kind of compute counts, and it informs you about colors of things and so forth. Um, and so the scenario is going to be we're going to prompt GPT-3 just to describe a particular category, like black-throated sparrow. Um, it's like going to go off a cliff and give us this like giant paragraph of text that is supposed to be human consumable. Um, it has lots of good information that looks attribute-like. So things like small bird, found in North America, white body, and so forth. Um, and we can just keep doing this for just a few variations of prompts, right? And amass a huge amount of kind of relevant textual knowledge about a target category. Okay. The kind of setup here is from this, we need to go to something which looks like phrases that kind of are plausibly attributes. Okay. And then from there, actually select ones which are potentially useful for recognition. Okay, so found in North America, this is, might be true, not visually perceivable, can't actually end up in our final classifier. Um, once we've kind of selected this subset of visually discriminative items, okay, what we're gonna do is just ground them directly using clip. Um, so folks who aren't familiar with clip, the way this works is essentially you embed text and images in a joint space, okay? And then if they're nearby, you say that you know, the text is appropriate for the image. And that's a kind of classifier. OK. So the kind of scenario is we just embed everything. And we'll say everything that's nearby the image from text space is true. OK. OK. So that's actually the whole idea. Um, I like it, actually, because it's so simple. Um, it has a chance to work over and over and over again. Uh, so this is kind of the figure from the paper. Just kind of rewind and see it all pasted together. Um, the setup is you're given a set of categories. These are ImageNet categories. You prompt the language model independently for every category. This gives you some sort of candidate attributes. Okay. From there, you perform some sort of optimization, which selects for useful ones under some criteria. Um, so I'll tell you about this in a second. It's kind of a submodular optimization. Um, this yields some number of concepts. Once you've committed to these, you run a standard bottleneck procedure, okay, where given the textual attributes, you embed them with the text encoder from clip. You embed the image with the image encoder from clip. You compute the compatibility of these items, so the distance in that shared space. Um, this gives you scores for you know, these attributes being in this image. Um, and then you learn a linear layer using training data. OK. Um, yeah? So I'm curious how well this works with like, when things get really specific. Because like, you talk a lot about like, 200 DOM frames in yeah. the gen, for instance, so, like, bird identification. There are a lot of birds with, like, for instance, like a black head and like, brown stripes down the yeah. does this, like, How does this handle this? OK, so there's, there's two things. So one is making sure that discriminative attributes are in this bottleneck. Yeah. So you need to make sure you have the like, name of the thing which tells the two kind of similar birds apart. Once you have it, um, Clip is actually more robust than you imagine. Um, so compositionality, yes, but this is actually independent attributes. Um, so if there are like, specific keywords that are important, which is what's happening here, it's going to get it. Um, So the kind of like key point to this actually is um, you need a selection routine. Like you can't be naive about what you put in here, right? Especially if you ever hope to accomplish something fine-grained, right? You actually need to optimize this piece so that it's good for whatever problem you have. Um, and so that's actually where the work comes in. Um, it's not too much work. Um, it involves just a little bit of training data and a little bit of heuristics. Um, the kind of like setup here is. We're going to get a bunch of text coming out of GPT-3. None of it looks like what we want. Um, right? So it's all like meant for human communication, none of it for classification. Um, so what we're going to do is just label 500 samples out of here to be things like concept bottlenecks that we kind of expect to work reasonably well. Um, so this is UA just sitting down for a day and just labeling data. Um, so like getting rid of long concepts, obviously non-visual concepts, 
and things that like don't plausibly look like they'll ever work in Clay. Okay, and just fine tuning a T5 model to eliminate these things. Okay, so the T5 model is just part of the loop now. Um, okay, and from there you get into this kind of tricky thing of like how do you actually pick useful concepts? Um, and this is uh, basically we rely on some old objectives that give us an excuse to be greedy. Um, so this is a submodular uh, setup where basically you're given like a superset of possible concepts. You want to select a subset of the score of these concepts such that that subset maximizes a measure which is submodular. Um, so in this case, we want to optimize discriminativeness, dis discriminativeness of the concepts with respect to the final prediction and their diversity. Okay, um, there's an objective for doing this. Essentially, like this is going to be, you know, how well clip aligns the scores of the concept with um, the final prediction. And this looks like if you kind of imagine covering a space and clustering the space, have you selected enough like elements from every cluster to cover the whole space? Okay. This thing's submodular, which means that if you're greedy in optimizing this, you're kind of accurate up to a constant factor. Um, so you have an uh, almost optimal procedure for optimizing this. Uh, for folks who like remember back in the day of how summarization used to be done, um, this is just straight borrowed from like submodular objectives for, for summarization circa 2012. Okay. So that's the whole story. Um, th these are the models, kind of the rest is evaluation and kind of proving that this recipe works over and over and over again. Um, basically, the way we've kind of set up the evaluation is to try to like cover different types of recognition problems that come up. Um, so this is like something like common objects, so things that appear in like ImageNet or CIFAR, so fine-grained about this question, so flowers, you know, food, aircraft, and, and birds. Um, actions, I can't like vouch for this data set, but this is essentially just like a sample from a frame during an action. Um, it's just okay. And then a bunch of like kind of strange data sets. These exist mostly for posterity because these are kind of zero shot evaluations that existed in CLIP. Um, the kind of one interesting one is skin tumors, which before I show you the results, um, basically like just before we wrote this paper, we were like, hey, interpretability is primarily important for medicine, but we have no medicine results. So we didn't have this data set. We just like three days before the deadline, we're like, oh, it'd be nice. And we you know, have some semi-positive results. Um, and we just added it. And so like three days later, the results were there. And so I kind of like, for better or worse, actually this is a kind of like held out data set for us. Um, OK. So OK, what are the evaluations? Um, basically, what we're going to be doing is comparing um, black box models of uh, using the same visual backbone. So the same exact clip model that we use to ground is the one that we're going to use to do black box prediction. Okay, so this is going to be a linear probe experiment. Um, and then we compare against some other kinds of um, attempts at generalizing um, concept bottleneck models. So one which is like kind of defeats the purpose but has been proposed, which is called post hoc um, concept bottlenecks. Essentially, you build a concept bottleneck but because it performs poorly, you, un you give yourself a route from the features directly to the prediction. And so this becomes a kind of ensemble that's still somewhat interpretable, but you have this completely uninterpretable route. Um, and then there was a kind of manually constructed concept bottleneck from um, LA Pavlik's group in 2022. Okay, um, that's the whole setup. Here's the performance. Um, you don't have to look at any of these plots in detail. I will kind of summarize it. Um, basically, this is every data set that I've shown you. On the x-axis is the amount of data that you give the system. OK, so we're evaluating you know, whether we have one training point. So that's one shot, two shot, uh, or the whole data set. OK, and we're doing the evaluation across all these data sets. The kind of like important one is the average here, basically. At few shot, okay, this dashed line is this kind of uninterpretable model. Labo is ours. 
at kind of low data regimes, actually ours is doing quite a bit better. But as the kind of amount of data saturates, um, all the, the two models look the same. OK. Yeah. Yeah, so shot, so okay, right. So training data here isn't in the NLP part, it's in the vision part. So it's, it's the part for training that final linear classifier for CBM, it's the amount of image training data you have to build the thing at all. Um, so the kind of idea, right, is that, um, the kind of motivation for this kind of experiment is that if you have very, very little data, it's hard to you know, you know, set up your black box model to do really well because it needs to adjust a lot. But there's a potential place where something like language model could succeed because it tells you what to look for ahead of time. Um, and this is actually plays out. Um, so the kind of language model gives you a good prior for what to look for and so you kind of can succeed at low data regimes. Okay. So this just says this <laughs> in, in, in words. So the kind of general setup here is actually um, for few shot we're doing better and for kind of big data regimes, so something like a million samples from ImageNet, these things actually converge. Okay. Good. Um, the kind of other evaluation here is some of these other kind of alternative proposals for building concept bottlenecks at scale. The kind of evaluations here are just on whatever evaluations um, these authors had. We didn't kind of run it on all of our data. So CIFAR 10 and 100, this was this post hoc bottleneck that kind of did the ensemble. Um, without the ensemble, we're better. Um, if, you, um, if you use their ensemble, which, is, which kind of breaks the interpretability intuition, um, actually uh, they're not <laughs> better than a particular kind of black box model. And even ours, which doesn't break, that interpretability intuition is still a bit better. OK. Um, and these kind of manually designed bottlenecks actually don't really work very well uh, when you try to implement them using clip models. So you really do need to do some sort of optimization. OK. OK, we did this uh, NLP style. So empirical results first, qualitative results later. Um, so here are some like examples of the top weighted um, categories uh, or concepts from the bottlenecks that we actually ended up constructing. So this is um, these uh, attributes that you know, GPT-3 proposed and sorted by their weight in the linear layer. Okay, so these are the most, um, the kind of attributes most supporting prediction. Um, so things are pretty good um, a lot of the time. Um, so badger, you know, short legs, um, you know, long body, um, maybe some extraneous information that hopefully Clip ignores. Um, black and white and striped, that's excellent. Um, not everything I think looks great. Um, probably the weirdest thing going on here is with hummus. Uh, so the kind of claim here, can we, we do, is this readable? Okay. Um, so hummus, the kind of number one attribute is it's kind of like made with chickpeas, tahini, olive oil, garlic, and lemon juice. Um, this is like not an obviously visual attribute, but it's still popped to the top. I think this is like not ideal, even though my kind of computer vision hat tells me this is kind of reasonable um, based on the way Clip was trained. Because people will probably describe what it's made of, and that's on the internet. And so implicitly we'll learn that all of this means hummus, as opposed to these are attributes of hummus. Um, so this is a kind of failed case with this kind of proposal. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's go. Yeah, okay, let me say two things here. Um, 
for this skin domain, nothing works terribly well. Okay. Um, so this is, it's not to say that you can't train a good classifier for this, but kind of for the skin domain, no classifiers generalize very well. Um, the kind of very narrow notion of generalization. Uh, and I'll show you some of that in a second in a different domain. This is kind of true for medicine, I think, in general. Um, that being said, for the common sense question, um, is this like a clip? Can clip actually return something reasonable and why? Uh, one of the students on this project um, constantly gets themselves checked for problems. Um, and they say this is exactly how doctors tell them to look on their body for these things. Um, so my expectation is actually there is content on the internet referring to images like this in this way. Um, this is like the non-technical way to actually search yourself. Um, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the answer is yes. Um, and I think of this as kind of like the fail of the interpretability pitch to some degree, right? In part because imagine you had a bottleneck concept that just said hummus. Like we've defeated everything. Um, and that, that's actually a little bit what's happening. Um, so it's like it could be spurious. It hasn't broken really it down in any reasonable way, and it's probably just an artifact of clip actually us not actually being able to execute the experiment we want with clip, which is exclude any data that has hummus in it, for example. Um, so I, I do think this is like a problem for this version. Um, it's definitely spurious, kind of diff you know circumvents the bottleneck in some sense. Um, I think the only other thing is we have some human evals which show that to some degree this isn't like the only thing happening. Um, this is like 70% of the time they're pretty good. Um, and so this can be improved. Um, yeah. I don't have the number off the top of my head, but this was like a, a debate of whether or not we want concepts which have are shared with high weight among many categories or not. And the kind of tension here is um, really performance, right? Because if you have like one concept which is like only indicative of one category, like it gives you this potential for sneaking it in, but also it could be like the most discriminative feature and it could be right, right? In some sense, this is like why old models of sentiment really work well, right? Like you just have that one word and it's just perfect. Like, great, okay, it goes. You say it's a good class, you know, positive sentiment. So this was like actually, um, me and CCB took opposite positions on this. Um, CCB was like share and I was like, they need to perform well, um, don't enforce anything about this. But I think if you had different notions of what you wanted and could kind of argue for them, I think you could incorporate it back here, right? Um, I think probably like reliability. You think you probably have something more causal because it's something shared and reused and so you can really evaluate uh, its contribution. Whereas if it's only in one, you risk this kind of more confounding. I think the performance angle, you don't have it because the one indicative feature will always be great for performance. Um, okay, let's keep going. Um, we'll definitely only get through half this talk. Um, so, okay, let me just conclude this piece. Um, so, just to kind of summarize, um, the kind of like basic questions we were asking were whether or not we could build these concept bottlenecks to be high performance kind of at scale in the sense of covering arbitrary tasks. 
Um, and the answer is actually, I think we've, we've made a pretty good argument that it's possible using GPT models, in particular because the kind of uh, classification tasks were fairly broad and arbitrary. Um, and so in as much as the GPT model has physical common sense that's covered, I think this is actually a functional proposal. Um, and in terms of performance, actually the argument's pretty good uh, because um, they're kind of not worse usually than uh, black box models and sometimes better in particular scenarios. Okay. So um, I think I took questions, which was kind of the end. So can you forgive me for not taking more? Um, okay. So we're going to do the thing which uh, I really want to talk about, so we'll probably not get to the other thing, um, which is uh, chest x-rays. So this is basically we published that paper at CVPR in 2023. Um, there's kind of like the natural motivation and extension of like what's going wrong with some of these medical domains. And so we've been studying x-rays for the last nine months, and we finally have some results. Um, and so um, basically, here's like a fact, which I'll justify in a second. Um, black box models uh, are way less robust on medical data than they are on natural images. Um, robust in this sense. Um, so there, if there's even a slight distribution shift for what they're tested on, you can expect catastrophic failure. OK. Um, so what does that mean? That means if I'm like in gold hospital and I collected gold data and built myself a gold model, I'll do really well on gold data. But when I take this gold model and try it on blue data, things will go wrong. Um, so we've shown this. And let me give you, yeah. I have not heard that, but in some sense, we're doing our own splits to prove these things. So I'll show you this is just true. Maybe that's like a way in which actually the performance is overestimated and like why we don't very clearly know that this is true, even though now we have like tons of results. Um, so maybe. Um, OK. <laughs> um, OK. So OK, chest x-ray. What's a chest x-ray? This will be the only close-up of uh, medical images. Um, so chest x-ray is really interesting in as much as we can all learn very, very quickly how to do this, um, as strange as that is. Uh, so here's a normal chest x-ray. Here's one from, um, from Wuhan in, early in the pandemic for a person who's COVID positive. Um, the kind of like way you go about this is there's like a procedure that most people follow. All doctor's procedures that you're trying to remember are always ABCs. Um, so you just find like an appropriate A. Um, so A is airway, um, so you need to like check that the trachea is not in a particular way. Okay, then you'll kind of keep going. The kind of the procedure roughly goes in terms of um, checking the airway, then checking the structures, so making sure the heart's not enlarged. This is a reasonable sized heart. Um, then you'll ch B is for bones, which isn't really relevant for viral diseases of the chest, but like make sure there aren't any broken bones. Um, okay, C for circulation, that's the heart. D for devices, because stuff could go wrong, um, and so forth. But basically what you need to see, I think it's actually kind of intuitive, uh, that like a clear lungs, that everything is well defined. There's a few signs that you want to double check for, which are anatomically relevant. Um, so things like, um, so this is your diaphragm, this is your heart, these are your lungs. Your diaphragm should be shaped like this and kind of goes back on a point. Um, that's important for what's in your lungs because if something's in your lungs, they'll fill from the bottom. Uh, and so it'll kind of cover up these important shapes of your diaphragm. Um, so to kind of like see it in COVID, um, kind of COVID's main feature is this thing called ground glass opacities. Basically, they go everywhere. 
if you have bad COVID, this is what it means for your lungs to be struggling. Basically, they've kind of like, you know, solidified in all over. And the kind of main feature of COVID is actually it's all over. Um, so this kind of pattern of like haze with opacity, um, that's, that's the kind of main sign of COVID. Um, this COVID patient's not doing well because also um, their, their left lung is like kind of filled with fluid at the bottom, right? So here you can see the shape of the diaphragm. Here it's blown out. Okay, so these are like reasons why you might know it's COVID. Um, here's a fact that justifies my claim that nothing works in medical images. Um, so one thing you can do with natural images is actually um, feature extractors for natural images are good even if they're untrained. Okay, so if you take, uh, I think this is like a fact known from early neural network literature. Basically, if you take a random combinet, don't train any of the parameters, it already extracts good features. You can build linear classifiers on those features without ever updating them. Um, so one thing that you can see for random images is, so this is you know, it's some aggregate of data sets and kind of performance on different random uh, feature scenarios. One is just random performance on the data set. The kind of baseline here is just lay down the pixels of the image such that it's the same dimensionality as your feature representation. Train logistic regression. Okay, this gets like roughly, you know, 17. ResNets are an improvement over pixels as a feature representation, untrained, and uh, vision transformer is even a little bit better. Okay, this is actually what we expect because actually there's a big prior in the architecture to do good computer vision and generalize. Okay, this is not true at all for chest x-rays. <laughs> um, so pixel features are an improvement over nothing, but no neural network structure is an improvement over pixel features a priori. Uh, yeah. Vertical axis here is some accuracy. Or it's just average accuracy across a sample of data sets in these domains. So this is like ImageNet, CIFAR, and some other ones. This is you know, a bunch of chest x-ray data sets that we have. So it's just the average accuracy over those data sets. Okay, we're definitely only getting through the vision part. I'm so sorry. Um, okay, so I'm gonna put put more uh, numbers to the fact that robustness completely fails um, in these contexts. And basically, what we've done is set up kind of different splits on different um, kind of uh, uh, chest X-ray uh, outputs. So fusion is. Um, one problem someone could have, abnormal is like a mix, COVID is that. So what we've done is we've kind of just split the data set into a founder that we know ahead of time. Okay, so we say only train on men, test on women. You know, train on one distribution of age, test on a different, okay, or a hospital split. Okay, and basically here's the result. Uh, <laughs> um, so there's very, very, very little generalization to these kind of adversarial splits within these networks. Um, some of these splits are totally unreasonable, right? So a, an age split is kind of like as tragic as it could possibly be. You expect some generalization, but if this really is like babies to adults, like probably not. Um, okay. Yeah, so I, I think of this as a diagnostic, not like a useful practical scenario. Yep. Um, so yeah, like certainly age, like disease prevalence across age is completely different, right? Like folks with who are younger than 20 will never have this kind of giant 
you know, ground glass opacity all through their lungs because they don't suffer from such severe COVID mostly. Right, so this will be a big problem. Um, but I think this is, this is more that like, you want to minimize this drop so that you're depending less on those features and more on ones that are kind of causal. And you're kind of trying to decide, you know, in this case, we're going to try to figure out, can we build a model that reduces this gap? OK. Um, and the kind of idea is, actually, this is a real split. Yes. Uh, and we really want to do this, but actually, this will be pretty hard. Um, OK. So the kind of like goal here, just to restate it, is, is actually what we want to do is um, we don't actually care too much about one distribution versus the other. We want to be good at both. Right? Because it would be silly right, to build a, a classifier which is just good for male chest x-rays. Right? We want to train on male chest x-rays and then be good at male and female because we've generalized for the right features. Um, okay, So the kind of goal is to be good at both of these things while minimizing the gap between the two distributions. Okay. Um, so um, basically, we've been running models like this, like not very deep extensions of Labo. I think the challenges here are data and underlying tools. So basically, what we've done is like trained a clip, a clip-like model for medical images, which is hard. We kind of like trained the best one. Lots of people messed up. We did it better. I don't think this is a contribution, but you kind of need to get all these pieces in place before you run Labo. Um, so we've been doing that. And we built a model for COVID using Labo and just visualized what are its knowledge dependencies. Um, and the first one is just completely wrong. <laughs> um, and actually, nothing in Labo actually told us to be causal. right? It just kind of, uh, we built it so that we could audit it later, right? And then realize, hey, this is actually a problem. Um, the second feature here is exactly this feature that I've been telling you about, uh, ground glass opacities. Um, you can actually like, look up the statistics of this, because it's medicine. 83% of severe COVID cases have this. Um, so this is really you know, the best feature to be looking for, but it's second place. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, it is, but it's just so extreme for COVID and everywhere. Like, there's actually no feature of COVID which is unique to COVID in terms of what it does to your lungs. That's why the PCR test is the thing. So basically, the way you do this study in the end is you do all of these radiological kind of, they call them findings, and then you relate their frequency with a positive PCR test, because none of them were actually enough. Um, OK, um, so I'm going to finish up um, and get to know NLP. Um, so part of what we've been doing is essentially um, iterating on how to construct these bottlenecks with both you know, different procedures and different sharing across different tasks and with like feedback from doctors about what's actually being used inside of them. And this is actually kind of. Uh, been nice, uh, kind of. I want to say NTASC agnostic bottlenecks are, seem very, very good for this domain in part because like radiologists approach a scan in a procedural way, almost always re irrespective of what they're looking for, and they're actually mandated to do this. Uh, so there's this thing called coincidental findings. If you're a radiologist and you go in to look for COVID and you miss a cancerous nodule, you'll like eventually get sued. Um, but people are kind of bad at this, um, and it's kind of like known because if you're going in looking for COVID, you're biased. So you look for COVID and not for something. But so people are trained to follow procedure to try to actually be um, more systematic. Um, so we've built some of these bottlenecks um, and kind of validated them. And actually, we've gotten some, quite a bit of improvement here, um, which we're pretty excited about. Basically, this could um, even help with the kind of base model itself. So the gaps kind of get quite a bit smaller. And actually, these kind of extreme, slightly nonsensical scenarios, um, we actually get better average performance than um, just training on one of the, one of the distributions. Um, the story for the real shift is a little bit more complicated. Um, 
In part, actually, we don't know what the confounder is. We have no idea. We know it's a different hospital, but every hospital like, makes every effort to uh, standardize their procedure. Why? So that you can, like, as a radiologist, work at multiple hospitals without like, having a year downtime to learn what they're doing. Uh, OK. Um, so I think we're actually doing better um, in terms of reducing the gap, but actually it's costing us a little bit too much <coughs> in domain. For, um, so we need, this is, this is what we're still iterating on. OK. So uh, we got to half the talk. <laughs> um, let me kind of just give you, um, just remind you of the story, and we'll end. Um, this is a paper we have in submission. Basically, the idea is um, to use GPT-3 to summarize a set of examples um, that, we give a, um, that we give from a data set to propose concepts and have these concepts set up such that GPT-3 actually proposes a prompt for itself, such that when it wants to recognize the concepts, it can feed itself the prompt and then output some sort of measurement of the concepts and then build a predictor. OK, that's it. Um, I am so sorry for going massively over. Um, let me just end with this, um, which is I'm hoping I've convinced you there's at least something interesting about trying to build these concept bottlenecks automatically, that we can have some hope to get inherent interpretability and actually probably have some use for it which I think is actually this uh, robustness experiment, to know what's wrong and actually like, have a hope to do something as an intervention. Um, and beyond that, thanks. And sorry for going over. <laughs> OK. Are there questions? Lots of questions. Uh, we can do that first. Also, doctor uh, concept feedback. So, do you think the concepts that you got from Labo would sort of indirectly uh, reflect the attributes that you wanted to be robust to? So, uh, you know, indirectly capture something specific about uh, like male chest chest X-rays, no. uh, or chest X-rays from this specific hospital that. Because, like in the case of like natural images, maybe. Uh, so, so, so let, let me answer. Um, so, the attributes that we've gotten for the medical images definitely don't reference any of these confounding attributes or confounding categories, because doctors are definitely not looking for them. Okay, so when they're looking for chest X-ray for COVID, um, like the overall appearance is affected by age or by gender, but those aren't actually the attributes that are relevant. Actually, the state of your lungs is relevant, and that actually generalizes. Um, so those things definitely don't appear. The things that we've gotten from doctors, uh, I think where we're suffering most is actually the procedure is too general for our evaluation, where they're having us come up with features like about bones, because this is part of the uh, like standard recognition procedure of like, hey, double check that nobody has a break that a doctor isn't aware of, right? Because why? That could maybe pierce your lung or something, right? So now we're looking kind of outside the body, and that has more indicative features um, of like gender and things like that, and that's getting in there. So I think like somehow the routine is actually slightly more general, and I think that's actually where we're suffering. Uh, but like for the causal features that look good, they actually have nothing to do with gender. And the doctors, irrespective, aren't looking at gender. Um, So the, the part of that that we're relying on is that 
the names uh, that we're assigning the concepts are genuinely what's being recognized. Um, to some degree, that's an accuracy question under a distribution. Right, if I'm very accurate at recognizing this under the expected distribution and that's the name, then we're good. Um, so, so, right, because it'll actually report faithfully what it's trying to find. Um, so that much we have verified. And it is true and not true, because some concepts are very hard to recognize, and we probably shouldn't have included them because they're unreliable. Yeah. Yeah. So that much we've also had an eval for, which is like the degree to which humans find them appropriate, and it's kind of mixed. So I think either way to verify that you believe this story works, you'll need a human eval on the bottleneck, sampled on some data to believe minimally they're accurate and they look causal and don't look leaky and you had a language model generate the text, does it even make sense, um, right? Like, uh, so you have to, yeah. So we've checked these things in the paper. It's not a, it's not 100% on any of it, uh, but uh, what's that? I have a related sort of, because I think the thing that I was kind of thinking about is uh, sort of human in version. So you could imagine running your exact same pipeline, but where you have a, you, you produce that list and then instead of coming in, or maybe after T5 is less uh, restrictive about what it allows through, you yeah. can ask a person which of these are attributes that you would be willing to trust or something like that. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. It chooses that subset and then you run from there. And then you kind of have a bit of that guarantee that it's close talk, but during the process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't know how much of an effect that would then have on the downstream. Yeah. So I, I've thought, I'll, I mean, I think you're proposing exactly the right thing, mm -hmm. which is a human in the loop. Mm -hmm. The trade off is accuracy. Right. Yeah. Um, so you need a right way to do this. I think that the, the optimistic way I've thought about doing this is actually um, what you do is you get a person in the loop. You, they do maybe post hoc evaluation once. You get some feedback about what's good and what's bad. Right? You actually try to influence the base generation of the language model like in context or fine tune it to do things more compatible with what the human thinks is OK. But then you still run the whole process without the human so that you can do optimizing for accuracy. Because I think the person will be bad at that. Actually, we know the person's bad at that, because that's the reason concept bottlenecks were kind of abandoned before. Um, yeah. 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 I have a question. I'm not sure if I can completely understand all the concepts here. But uh, so the prediction uh, of the final class is done from the linear model, or? Yeah. So since it's now is based on all these concepts, and the concepts make guess they encompass on probability. Yeah, it, it kind of, I've glossed over this detail, and yeah. kind of depends on the scenario. For um, medical, we made probabilities, like actual logits, and made sure they were sigmoided. For the general images, they were just compatibility scores. Yeah. So like the distance between. Yeah. Uh, what, what I'm trying to get to is basically all models fail sometimes, right? So all predictions as well. Um, and it's actually quite insightful to have prediction or a, a, a trust in how trustworthy they think they are. Right? So if you get a prediction and it's a 1.0, I'm super certain it's right, then hopefully that's right. And if it's a something like 0 0.7, then hopefully it is still right, but uh, you keep it less trust, right? So that is actually, I think, something that might be useful. And with the concept, I could see that this would <coughs> be easier to kind of arrange because uh, deep neural networks inherently are kind of, how to say, it, trusting themselves a little bit too much. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so you could like hope to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's fair. So if your concepts were really probabilistic, you could calibrate them in individually and hope that that keeps the calibration more stable for the whole classifier. I feel maybe that's what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, it's equally kind yeah. of a yeah. So have you done any thing in that direction? Or I haven't. Honestly, I haven't thought about this calibration question at all, but it's probably important. Um, 
in part because like I've been coming at this more from the general vision side where I'm like these are just feature values of scores and actually I don't negative infinity and infinity is fine. Um, yeah, so I think it could be kind of interesting, especially just reporting that and seeing if you could get more out of it because you're more of a structured model. I think that could be interesting. Okay. Thank you, Mark, again. We'll stick around for a few minutes.